Okay, so uh, welcome back everybody. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna have a little panel session. I've got a panel of experts of various shades, um, students and supervisors, who are going to talk um, briefly, first of all, about their tips for success. And um, so we're gonna go along the line. They can introduce themselves. We're gonna start with um, Simon at the end. They're gonna go along and just introduce themselves, give you their tips for success, and then we're gonna open it up for um, questions and answers. Okay, so Simon. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me all right, yeah? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit, um, so if anyone can't hear me, there's, there's not much more I can do. Um, so I'm Simon, I'm in the College of Medical and Dental Sciences. Um, I've nearly finished my PhD. I'm actually going to uh, submit, uh, I'm gonna sit my Viva uh, four weeks today. Um, so maybe I should be somewhere else working, but well, what can you do? Um, so the first tip that I have for any new researchers is, uh, it's going to sound quite cheesy, but honesty is the best policy. Um, so, you know, you're going to be surrounded by people talking about things you don't understand, throwing acronyms at you, um, and the best thing to do is just be honest from the start. And, and, you know, if you don't get something that your supervisor's talking about, just say, I don't understand that. Because, like, senior academics um, and professionals can often just forget, I suppose, what it's like to be uh, a new student and forget that, that you don't know as much as they do. So it's basically, if you try and play the game and pretend that you know what they're talking about and nod and smile, then they'll find you out eventually and that will be really ugly. Um, so it's, it's worth just being honest with them from the start. Um, and a, particular, a particularly important way of applying this is to be realistic with deadlines. So I used to uh, kind of go through this phase of like, we'd, we'd arranged a, a deadline and I would just struggle to try and meet the deadline even if I knew that I, you know, I hadn't done enough work and I would hand something in um, just for the sake of it. And I realize that that's not a very serious way of, of, of respecting your supervisor's time by asking them to, uh, to read something that, that you know is of a, a poor standard. So it, it's, it, you shouldn't be afraid to play the kind of, I can't meet this deadline card, but obviously you can't play it too many times because then you get in trouble as well. Um, so there's, there's a kind of balance to be struck there. Um, but yeah, the overall message I want to get across is to try and be honest with your supervisors and be realistic about what you think you can achieve, achieve and what you know. Um, so the second piece of advice uh, is, is more fun, I think. Um, it's just to be social and go to as many events as you can. Um, so go to the grad school coffee mornings, um, go to any of the union. I think the coffee mornings might have passed already by now, but um, you know, I met most of the friends that I have now either at this coffee morning or through people I met at the coffee morning. So just, you know, you have to be as, as shameless as you can and just go to the coffee morning, speak to anyone, don't be shy, um, get phone numbers even if you've just met people, otherwise you won't ever see them again. Uh, and yeah, just you know, build your social network because like, doing a PhD can be a kind of lonely experience, it can be stressful, I think everybody will find that at least at some point. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really important to have friends with you who you can you know, kind of sound off to over coffee or over lunch or someone you can kind of take with a bottle of vodka to the Shropshire countryside and just kind of have a good time and just, <laughs> you know, uh, just to get away from it all kind of thing. So it's really worth making sure you have a network of good, of good people around you who you can rely on and who can help you out. And obviously you can offer that back to them as well. Um, so yeah, in summary, those are the two things that I think you should do. Is firstly, be honest. And secondly, uh, make some good friends and hold on to them. So, hi, I'm, I'm Laura. I'm about halfway through my PhD at the moment. Um, and I work in the School of Biosciences. So um, I've only got, again, two main points that I've tried to summarize. Um, I would definitely recommend, as soon as you start, trying to really understand your subject area. Start reading papers, attending seminars. It might be quite uh, tough to start off with, but the more that you can read in the early days and weeks and months, the better a base you'll have for your research. The more you understand your field, the, the more you'll be able to guide your research and make sure that at the end of it you are producing something that's novel and, and impacting in your field. Um, and the second one's actually, I'm going to agree with Simon, is be as social as you can um, and try and build up a network of people around you. Uh, there will be peaks and troughs in, during the course of your PhD, definitely. There will be great days so you'll need people to go and celebrate with and there will be tough days where you need those people around you to carry you through. So um, be as social as you can, get onto committees, uh, sports teams, P 
people in your school or college, just try and meet as many people as you can and build up a nice network of people. And again, trust in your supervisor, talk to them, be very vocal. Um, yeah, that would be my advice. Hi, um, my name's Akash and um, I'm part of the School of Chemical Engineering. Uh, and I'm coming to the end of my uh, PhD. Well, I'm doing an NGD, which is a PhD with a talk component as well as industrial sponsorship. Um, and just going to talk through a few points that I think are good and bad of my experiences through a PhD. So similar to these guys in that you should read papers when you start and be sociable. There are very, two very key things to do. But with your supervisor, make sure you plan what you want to say to them when you meet them. Their time is quite valuable. And if you say something silly early on in a meeting, you can sometimes see them turn off and they're not really going to listen to the rest of your meeting. Uh, but always, if you've got something you want to say to them, don't be scared to say it. And if it's controversial, so if it's in your field and you're going to say something that you can argue each way, go there with evidence. Because at the end of the day, they're still in that field because they love it. If you can prove to them that you know what you're on about, you've got them on your side, you can go forward with your research. Um, that's something I've had to do and it's, it, it is quite successful because then you can have more of a discussion and they kind of see you as more of a peer instead of a student, which is quite a nice thing. Uh, one of the bad things to do, which I definitely did in my uh, end of my second year, was lose focus. Um, it's one of the hardest things to do is stay focused for four years or three years, depending on how long your PhD is, um, and you can get lost quite quickly. So one thing I got from realising that is the best way to get over it is to be as planned as possible. Give yourself weekly deadlines, monthly deadlines, and try and stick to them. Anything you try and plan to do, in my experience, because I do a lot of work in the lab, it takes twice as long as what you actually think it will take. So if you plan two weeks, you know it's going to take a month. So try and gauge that into your timings because it's not just about yourself. If you're in a, if you're in a research group, then you've got equipment booking times that they're out of your hands and other people's work has to be taken into account there as well. Um, the last thing I want to say is the same as these guys really, be as sociable as you can because um, it will help you massively. Because like, like they say, you have bad days and if you've got your friends there around you, you're all going through the same thing. You're not working on the same field, but you're all going through the same ups and downs. And you will definitely have ups and downs through a PhD. Persevere. And the final point I wanted to say was, with a PhD, you get out as much as you put in. If you put in the work, you'll be able to attend conferences, get published, meet a lot of new people. If you don't, you probably might still get through it, but you'll probably hate it a little bit more. Whereas you should really enjoy it. If you put the time in, you'll really enjoy it. That's the last thing I want to say. So. Uh, hello, I'm Siddhartha. I'm a faculty in the Department of Economics, Birmingham Business School. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome again. It must be a kind of an exciting time for you as you start your journey to building a you know, new st stock of knowledge but it's also probably a bit daunting because you, some of you know, but a lot of you might think, where do I start? How do I speak to my supervisor? Will I finish? So yeah, it's, it's quite natural to have these kind of anxieties. Now, fortunately, the students have given excellent advice to which I, you know, there's not that much to add. And I would think that the first thing I would just really like to add to that is, in terms of your subject, I know it's a bit cliched, but be obsessed. You know, you might even become a bit of a bore when you try to uh, talk to your housemates about your PhD thesis, but it's a good sign that you're excited about what you're doing if you find yourself a little obsessed with what you're doing, okay? So I think that's a good sign for a PhD student. Now, coming to the PhD supervisor-student relationship, I think you've heard some excellent things from students. Be honest, that's what I tell all my students. It's okay to make a fool of yourself in front of me. If you're not honest, if you say, yeah, that's fine, I know this, I know that, I'll expect you to know it, and then if I find you don't, then that's a bit shocking and that does damage the supervisor-student relationship. Uh, in terms of how you actually tackle the supervisor-student relationship, I think really the best bet is to speak to other students. I mean, I, I make it official, I tell my new students, speak to students I have supervised in the past, find out my idiosyncrasies. I know, for instance, that uh, you know, if, if, if my student comes and talks to me in the morning, I'm not really there. So they usually schedule 
appointment in the afternoon. For other supervisors, it'll be just the opposite. Second, find out what your supervisor's style of speaking is. I mean, some people are very reserved. When they say, you're almost there, it means start all over again. Whereas I'm quite blunt. If I say, well, it's almost there, I really mean that you're making good progress. So that's important because you want to make sure that you're clued in on what your supervisor is telling you. As you progress, obviously, you'll see your supervisor will be taking important steps to gauge your progress and also pushing you, hopefully, to build a good network of people in your area so that not only do you learn from each other's uh, work in the area, but you have a good network of people to tap to when you want to find out you know, what else is going on, how do I place myself, what, you know, what journals would be most acceptable, for this, of course, there your supervisor is there, but given your very specialized field, you'd probably have a host of people you'd meet who might be, be even better. And last of all, enjoy it. You know, it's, it's a great experience. You're doing something which hopefully no one has ever done. So even if it's frustrating, go for it and enjoy it. Thank you. Okay, my name's uh, Susan Hunston, and uh, I'm a professor in the Department of English Language and Applied Linguistics in the College of Arts and Law. Um, I did my PhD when I was in my mid-30s, uh, and I did it part-time. Uh, so I was working full-time at, at the same time as I was doing my PhD. So my experience was in some ways uh, a bit different from the conventional um, PhD student. Um, I have a little metaphor that I use with students, and this is a wonderful opportunity for me to say it to a slightly bigger audience. Doing a PhD is like going on a journey. And when you start, you're standing outside a thick forest, and you know that you have to find your way through the thick forest. Sometimes you think that your supervisor is in a helicopter and can see the end of your journey, even though you can't. This is not true. Your supervisor is standing in the same place as you are, and like you, they don't know what the end of your journey is going to be. The only difference is that they have walked alongside other students taking different paths through the forest. One thing you might want to do is to read the thesis that other, uh, another, other theses by other students in a similar field. This is a very good thing to do at the beginning, but just remember not to believe them. Because when somebody writes a thesis, they tell the story of their journey as though it was a straight line. They started off with the questions, they answered the questions, they wrote the results. This is not how it happened. So remember that this is how you will tell the story of your journey when you've finished, but it's not the way the journey will happen. You will go down dead ends, you will go round in circles. You can get guidance from your supervisor, but in the end, finding the path is your job and you will absolutely find it. Um, manage your working week. Make sure your best time is your PhD time. Manage your health take rest time, take exercise time, but remember that you will become obsessive and your best ideas may happen when you're walking or when you're in the shower. Carry a notebook with you at all times, except when you're in the shower. You'll learn by writing, don't put it off, don't expect it to be easy. Getting the best from your supervisor and here I've got a, a series of make sures. Make sure you understand what your supervisor is telling you and what your supervisor is asking you. If you're unlucky and you have a supervisor like me, most of the time they're asking you questions and the questions always mean something. Uh, with your supervisor's permission, take a voice recorder into the supervision and record everything. It means you don't have to take notes at the same time as you're listening and talking, and you can play it back afterwards. There's one rule accompanied to this. 
this voice recording remains private to you. It doesn't get shared with anybody else and you never make the supervisor listen to it again. Um, make sure you have deadlines. When you leave a supervision, make sure you know when the next one is and what you need to do before it. Don't cancel a supervision because you haven't met the deadline. Meet the deadline. Take the supervision record form seriously. Think carefully about what you want from each supervision session. You take charge of the process. Make sure you understand what your supervisor is recommending and how the supervisor regards your process, your progress. Read what the supervisor's written and be alert for politeness. Things like this could be better argued may mean you really aren't arguing this well enough and you need to change the way it's being done. Um, often students think they're doing worse than they should be because the supervisor is ticking the satisfactory box and not the very satisfactory box, or they think they're doing better than they should be, so if in doubt, check that. Um, and finally, do make sure you know who you need to go to if things go wrong. If you come in next week and your supervisor isn't there anymore, who do you go to to solve that problem? Um, I was going to finish with getting the best from your fellow students, but I think everybody has um, said that already. Join your department or your school postgraduate research group, and if there isn't one, start one, and enjoy yourselves. Okay, well that, <clears throat> that is difficult to follow because that was really excellent advice from, from not just Susan but from all our panellists. Um, well you've already met me or heard me briefly, I'm Gavin Schaffer, I'm a professor in history. Um, I have a few little tips for you. The first one of which is to not be defensive with your work. Um, as um, somebody on the panel has already said, all of your PhDs are inherently original. That's the point of uh, a PhD. But that doesn't mean that you are working for the Secret Service and you should lock yourself away and not speak to anybody. There is no greater fear in academia than that somebody is going to publish exactly the same thing as you the week before you do and that it's going to be a bit better. Um, well, I can put that fear to bed right here by telling you that that will happen. People publish lots of things all the time, and this kind of obsessive quest to protect your little field is unsustainable. All it will mean is that nobody in your field will know who you are, Nobody in your field will have conversations with you and you won't learn from them and they won't learn from you. From watching my students, and this is not advice I took, but from watching my PhD students, the people who do best are the people who go out to conferences and network and share their research with people. You don't give people full drafts of your work, but kind of fairly openly share your research with people because then you get to find out what's going on you make friends, you make contacts, and those networks are the kind of networks that get you postdocs and get you jobs and, and get, you, get you published. Um, the next thing I want to say is to make sure that your supervisor knows what your goals are. People go into PhDs for all kinds of different reasons and they have different levels of ambition. Supervisors are not mind readers. You've got to make it very clear what you want and how you think you're going to get it. They will tell you maybe if they think that's realistic or unrealistic, but at least then you will both know what you want. It also protects you from a problem that I had, which is that supervisors supervise in a changing world. When I did my PhD, which wasn't that long ago, my supervisor told me, and I had a very, very wonderful supervisor, and he told me, do not publish anything doing your PhD. The most important thing, if you've got a bit of extra time, finish the PhD, work on the PhD, polish the piece of work, don't publish anything. When I did my PhD, that was pretty good advice. But now, that is not good advice. Now, that would be absolutely, well, I would say it would be kind of dangerous advice. 
So you need to make sure that your, your supervisor is dealing with the world that you are in and not the world that they were in when they did theirs. Um, I think the final things that I want to say, I mean, it is important to enjoy a PhD. We're working in a highly pressurized environment, but really the first two years or, or, or first four years of your part time, you can't do much about um, how successful you're going to be at the end. That's the time to enjoy it. Academia and all the other careers that spin off a PhD are really stressful. If you can't have fun in the first year of your PhD, you never will. Um, so do enjoy yourselves and, and try and gorge yourselves on your research. Um, when you are having slumps, and you will have slumps, days when things are just not going right, weeks when things are just not going right, my advice, and this is just purely personal, is to try and make sure you carry on doing a little bit each day. Even if it's just half an hour or an hour or whatever it, whatever it is, it's much more healthy to keep going through your slump than to build up a big anxiety and then find you haven't done anything for three, four weeks and you don't know even where to start to go back to it. The final thing I want to say um, again, is very personal, and it is this. Do not see a PhD as a final goal, because it absolutely is not. When my PhD got finished, it got finished and it, uh, uh, and it, and it passed, but I knew in my head that it wasn't, it wasn't the piece of work, the piece of research that I'd always dreamed of producing. The piece of work that I'd always dreamed of producing took several more years. It took change. My PhD really then formed the basis of several bits of research that I published in different directions. So don't think that that project has to be your final word on that subject. It doesn't. What it has to be is a quality, original piece of research which passes the PhD. And if that opens your eyes and inspires you to work in a particular area, and you think, oh, well, I, but now I'd like to do a bit more on this, and now I'd do a bit more on that, that's ideal. So, so, so don't look at it as the end of the road. Um, that's all I have to say to you. What we would really like to do now is to take questions from you. So um, you've got high quality students, you've got high quality supervisors, and I'm not talking about myself. So any questions you have um, for the panel? Yes, the young man at the front. <laughs> uh, is it okay to ask for additional meetings with a supervisor if I feel that they would be helpful? Who would like to answer that? Open that to all the panel. Can you repeat the question? Please? Is it okay to ask for additional meetings with your supervisor? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say yes. Definitely, definitely. If you feel like you need more time, more face time with your supervisor, certainly approach them and request for the time. They might be really busy, they might tell you that they can't uh, fit that in immediately, but it will flag up to them that you need help, you need guidance, you need more assistance. It's definitely not a bad thing to ask for more time, more help if you need it, definitely. Well, students bound to say that. What, <laughs> do, the, what do the supervisors say? Um. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't really see uh, a set amount of hours that I set aside for students. So yes, definitely additional meetings, as long as they're for specific questions, more than welcome. The only thing is students also need to be flexible about when they want to uh, see me. I mean, if they say, I need to see you urgently today, it's probably a bad idea. I might be hooked up today, but yes, uh, I mean, I, I don't even count them as additional meetings. I say, see me whenever you need to. Yeah, just to, can I add something? Of course. Um, yeah, so I don't, I, I'm sure some people on this panel will disagree with me, but so I have three supervisors, and for two of them, I actually have access to their Outlook calendars, and they know about that. Um, so, I, <laughs> <laughs> so I can actually see when they're busy and when they're not, but I, I'm, I'm sure some supervisors probably wouldn't like that kind of, uh, that, that level of, uh, I don't know, they might consider it intrusive, but I find that very helpful. So maybe that's something to negotiate with your supervisor, or maybe not. Well, I mean, I think this is, I mean, it's something that came up in something that several people said, which is that you've got to get to know your supervisors as human beings. People work in different ways. 
Um, I, I, there is absolutely no way I would ever give anybody my Outlook calendar if I, I, unless, I, unless I was forced at gunpoint. But what, but what I do do is I give all my PhD students my mobile number. And there are some supervisors who, would never do, who, who wouldn't do that. Um, so, and the, the reason I do that is because I hate the idea of a student having like a, one of those mega crises that we all have from time to time and not being able to give me a call. And my, my students respond to that with real respect. So they don't phone me every day or every week. They phone me in the event of an emergency and they know that I don't mind that. And I know that they're not gonna take advantage of that. Other supervisors are much more regimented, but will be extremely professional, but want to see you when they've agreed that they, they, they'll see you. So really it is a meeting of minds, isn't it? It's about working out how they like to work and then working out how you like to work and kind of meeting in the middle. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. Do you want to say it into the microphone? I should have waited. It's my fault. Um, how uh, is the uh, supervisor's role different, if at all, for a Master of Research students who are studying at the university for a year? Oh, um, how is the supervisor's role different if you're supervising an MRes student from a PhD student? I, I actually did an MRes uh, before I did my PhD, um, and I, I found that there was probably more focus initially with the MRes because I only had a year to get everything done, so it was a bit more directed than a PhD was. Um, but I think I was quite fortunate in that my supervisor was very good, so we had regular group meetings as well as individual meetings as well. But again, if you ask, I think it's, from, from a student's point of view, it was, it was probably more directed, uh, supervisors more directed with their time. But you, you, you guys will be able to tell how you feel about MRS students, I guess. Um, I, I regard, I would regard an MRS student as in, in exactly the same position as a PhD student. I would expect to see them the same amount of time Obviously, the thing we're aiming at is a smaller piece of work, uh, and so there's less time for working out what the exact research question is. There's less time for trying things out. Um, but also, the piece of work you're aiming at is, is very much a training piece of work, uh, and so... Um, that all fits together. The time and the standard of the work and the, and the scope of the work all, all fit together. But essentially for me, the, the MRes student is, is the same. They're the same, um, the same kind of being as a PhD student. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It, it, it is the, an MRes student is exactly the same kind of being. Um, I did uh, an MRes, it was called an MPhil at that time, but it was essentially an MRes, that's what it was. Um, and what I remember from that year is it actually took me quite a long time to work out um, the different expectations of PGR research. So if I had an MRes student, especially if they didn't have a previous master's on top of that, I would be maybe slightly more aware that, that, that they, ne they needed to focus, what I needed to spend even more time talking about what they needed to get out and, and how they needed to do their work than maybe I would be as a with, with a PhD student. But I think Susan is right. I mean, it, it's inherently just a slightly smaller thing, but its essence is is pretty similar. Yes, I see that. Go on. Do you think the uh, postgraduate researcher supervisor relationship is different at all for part-time or distance learning students um, I'll throw that to the whole panel yeah. uh, part-time and distance students um, I about two-thirds of the students I supervise are part-time and mostly those are distance and we have supervisions by Skype uh, I think their experience is partly the same and partly different. Um, 
we, it took me a long time to learn how to supervise by Skype. Uh, I hated it at first. Um, I'm getting better at it. I think the difficulty is that it's more, it's more difficult to have silences by Skype. If you're in the same room, a question can come up and you both sit silent for several minutes while you both work out the answer to the question. And then you have a sort of form of interaction with not whole sentences and you, you gradually work your way to an answer to the question. To me, it's much more difficult to do that by Skype. Um, so the student really has to be, um, I think for me, really has to be able to work more independently and lead, need less guidance from the supervisor because that kind of joint idea is more difficult to generate from my point of view by Skype. Um, I was going to say something else and I can't remember what it was. That'll have to do for the, uh, for, for the, for the student obviously of course also work, doing a PhD part time. Time management is much more uh, challenging and it may be much more a case of doing the paid job for part of the week and doing the PhD for the other part of the week. And it's even more important to uh, do those things about having rest and having exercise because your time is really very, very full. Okay, there's, we, have, we have a question at the back. If you do you want to, sorry to interrupt you, can you just wait for the mic? Thanks, I'm just interested in the panel's views because you sort of fairly sp split those from the students and from staff. What support do you provide or is available or guidance for um, preparing for your final Viva? Preparing for a Viva? Yeah. So um, the, the question is, um, can we talk about the support we provide for preparing for a viva? So maybe we'll start with the, the man who's preparing for a viva. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that right now. Uh, <laughs> no, um, there's, there's absolutely loads of support. Um, so the grad school runs a very uh, useful um, kind of class type workshop thing. It goes on for about two hours called Surviving Your Viva, um, which I thought was really helpful. So I recommend that everyone uh, would get onto that. Uh, in terms of my supervisors, they're, they're, I've got a mock viva which is going to be happening in a few weeks. I don't know if all supervisors would actually offer that. I guess that's up to the discretion of the kind of uh, the supervisors and the student and what, what they want to do. But even though that's, that stands to be more terrifying than the actual viva because obviously my supervisors know where all the skeletons are buried, um, I think it will actually be very useful. So there's that. Um, and yeah, just. I, I can only speak from my personal experience, but my supervisors have been very helpful and I found that the university uh, has offered quite a lot of help with that as well. Um, and, and an invaluable thing is to obviously speak to other people who have done their vivas as well, who, who you know, uh, and get their feedback about it too. So it just makes the whole experience a bit less uh, terrifying. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I think the careers um, advice service on campus also run a preparing for your viva course as well, which I've heard is very good. I haven't been on it myself yet. Um, and the school that I'm in at the moment, so the College of Life and Environmental Sciences, they do a similar thing where they have a, a mock viva a year before your viva and then a few months before again, and that includes your supervisor, which I've heard is scarier than the actual viva is as well. Um, but yeah, there do seem to be lots of resources on campus and within the colleges to help you prepare for your actual viva. So. Are we all going on this? Do you want to come yeah, in? Um, with with uh, the School of Chemical Engineering, they have an end of year, at the end of your first year you have to write a report. Uh, and then you get vibed on that so that they know where your focus is going, but it also gives you an idea of what a viber could be like. Um, again, it's similar to these guys, you can have mock, in, mock vibers, which will be helpful. Um, but I'd say a lot of my friends that have, have passed their vibers are saying the best way they got through it was by talking to their, their friends that had done them already um, because they knew exactly what kind of questions could possibly arise. And it's actually your work. So. Um, we've already mentioned here that when you write your PhD it's basically telling a story so you 
one of the big things to do for preparing for your viva is read your PhD again, because by the time you sit your viva, it'll be quite a, a big gap. So I know for mine, I'd be at least three months after I submitted, I'd have my viva, so I'm bound to have forgotten parts of what I've, I physically wrote. So go back and read your, your own thesis, probably a bit, good bit of advice. Uh, well, in economics, we have formal workshops, so by the time my students get to the viva stage, they're used to preparing uh, public talks and answering questions from a deliberately unfriendly audience. Yes. Um, now, it, it, it will vary from supervisor to supervisor. I, I do give mock vivas to my students, but what I do is I bully two of my colleagues and tell them, please give a mock viva to my student, and please be really nasty and tough. I mean, if your supervisor doesn't do it, you might suggest that he or she does that to you before your viva. Yeah, I, I think, um, obviously mock vivas are reasonably useful, except in my experience, the questions that are asked in the mock vivas are rarely the questions that come up in the main vivas, so I'm always uh, a, a little bit wary. The best preparation is uh, read, make sure you really know your thesis. Uh, read it very carefully beforehand. Um, and uh, the other thing I would say is remember that if you're, if you're an examiner in a viva with a really, really good student, you will ask really, really difficult questions because you will see how, you will want to see how far you can push the student to becoming even better. Uh, and so if you're a student going into the viva, and you're being asked really, really difficult questions, it probably means that your thesis is very good. I think um, one of the things that you have to come to terms with when you go from being an undergraduate to a postgraduate is that feedback can become not very nice. Um, you only tend to become a postgraduate if you are a good undergraduate, right? And if you are a good undergraduate, what you have genuinely been told throughout your career is how clever you are. And then all of a sudden you start doing PGR research, or even worse, you decide to send an article to a journal. Um, and somebody, in very simple terms, will tell you that you're not clever at all, that your work is foolish. Um, because academia, although it's becoming, this is becoming slightly less the case nowadays, works in a slightly adversarial way. We tend to speak very frankly to each other and people sometimes don't pull their punches. This does not mean that you are a fool, but you do have to get used to it. Now, my academic life has been a slow example of get, trying to get less sensitive and trying to accept that, because to be honest, it isn't very nice when something you've worked quite hard on is criticized, but that's what academic life is like. And the Viva is, can be, a very good illustration of that. Um, I think if you go to seminar series, lectures, papers in your department, you will get a feel for how academics talk to each other. And that will enable you to feel stronger in your Viva because you will realize that you are being talked to not as a goody-goody undergraduate, but as a academic. And that is really what you want. In terms of how you play that, I always say you can go two ways with a Viva examination. You can either listen to the criticism um, that is being offered of your thesis and defend your thesis and say, well, you know, with the greatest respect, I don't think you're quite right about that. The reason I wrote this is because X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to defend it. Or you can do what I've seen other people do and say, oh, thank you so much for that. I'll have a think about it you know, it's very, very nice of you to criticise me in this way. Um, and I think the truth is that good Viva defence nowadays is a combination of the two. You've got to learn where your thesis needs to be defended and you've got to learn where sometimes, as I said before, it's not a final piece of work, so you've got to learn sometimes when people, you say, actually, yeah, you are right about that, I, I probably did get that wrong. And if you get the balance of that right, you'll be fine. Um, but. When you've done that amount of work, nothing except a kind of a, a trail, a, a fanfare of trumpets 
telling you how wonderful you are is going to make you feel good. So a vibe or even a good one is likely to, um, to feel tough at the time. I think quite often with hindsight you think, oh, actually, it, it, they did ask tough questions, but it was actually quite good. But maybe at the end of a PhD when you really just want to be told your work is wonderful, um, it won't necessarily feel like that. Okay, um, yes, we have a question at the back. If you could just wait for the mic to get to you. I'll also stand up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is there um, too much uh, intervention from your supervisor, and in what case does that happen? I also I want questions um, answers from both sides, and I also have in mind um, what Dr. Hunston said about the supervisor working with us in the jungle. So. Is there a possibility of them cutting off our path for some reason, and why? So, sorry, um, just to be very clear, are you asking, is there a risk of there being too much intervention from your yes. students? That's your question. Okay. Um, shall we start with the students? Um, yeah, I, I guess there, there could be a risk of that, um, because, you know, it's meant to be a collaborative effort, but, uh, so, well, I kind of got kept being reminded of by my supervisor in my first year was, you know, it's your project. And actually, initially, I began, I found that quite scary. So in that way, I, I sort of thought, thought there were almost, not, not that there wasn't enough, but I, I was kind of surprised a little bit by that, this, this whole idea of, well, actually, you know, I'd asked this question to my supervisor, imagining that, you know, she was, you know, the kind of god of this field. And then it'd be like, well, what do you think? I'm not, not really that used to that. Um, so there is, there's, again, I guess it, it comes back down to the, the sort of personal relationship that you have with, with your supervisor and, and the, the, the level that you want, because of course you want their guidance because they are experts and they know what they're talking about, but they have to let you learn and make mistakes as well. Um, and I think if, if you're going through the experience and you, and you think that they're intervening too much or not enough, then it's up to both of you to figure that out. And I guess you have to be brave as a, as a researcher and, and, uh, and be happy to, to mention that to your supervisor if you think that they're not involved enough or that they're too involved. Yeah, I mean, from my personal experience, um, in the first year, I had much uh, a greater level of support or intervention, as it will be, um, and that's because I was, you know, I was learning how to be a PhD student, um, and gradually the the level of intervention, if you want to call it that, has reduced as I've progressed. So I think there can be there's got to be the balance, you've got to be open and honest with your supervisor and if you feel like there's, you want a bit more, more room to stretch then I guess build a case for it, bring uh, ideas to the table, be vocal, support your own ideas and prove that you're ready to kind of drive your own project and, and move forward with it. So yeah, I guess just be vocal. Again, it's, it's, it's about knowing your supervisor. So my personal experience with my supervisor, I feel I've got quite a good supervisor, is that if, I, if they're telling me, no, don't go down this, this route, it's normally because they've either seen it somewhere before and they know why, in which case, ask them why. Don't be too scared to say, okay, they must be right. Ask them why you're not allowed to you know, do this area. There, there must be a reason. Um, but if you think you are, correct and, and, and you know better, say, then go with evidence. Um, if you turn up to your supervision and they're saying, no, you can't do this because of X, Y, and Z, and you go, actually, recently, these articles show that I can do this now, uh, you might not have been able to. You know, research constantly contradicts itself and improvements are made all the time. You know, the, uh, my supervisor once said to me, your, uh, once your thesis is done and you, if you pass your viva, your research will be probably become obsolete in 20 years. You know, because if you, if you look at anyone's thesis 20 years ago, new things are always found, new analytical techniques are available to do better research, and they disprove what you found 20 years ago. So if you find a way of doing something, be confident enough to say it. And a lot of the time, it's about doing smart research. So sometimes they might say to you, don't do that, because it might not be the best way. There might be a better way. They might want you to go out there and find a better, more a quicker path, so to speak, from the, from the example we had earlier. But most of the time, they're just trying to help you. So they don't want you to fail. They don't want you to do bad research. 
So if they're saying it, they're saying it for a reason, and you just got to find out what that reason is. Uh, well, I mean, I think it's usually the case that uh, you'd strike the right balance, but it could be that there's a little too much intervention from your supervisor, because like you, your supervisor is getting obsessed with the topic, which is a good sign that, you know, the topic's really interesting, but that can be daunting. I mean, we did have a colleague where the student would come in every day and work with the supervisor, and then the supervisor would complain that the student wasn't independent enough. So if you see that happening, take a step back, think about it, and find a polite way to tell your supervisor you do need a bit of space to work the problem at your own pace. There's a, there's, this isn't really an answer to your question, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, there's, al <laughs> there's always a point in the supervision process when the student takes ownership of the thesis. And sometimes it happens in week three of starting. Sometimes it happens three weeks before the viva. Ideally, it happens somewhere around 15 months in. When the supervisor says to the student, you know, I think it would be a good idea if you did such and such and the student says no I'm going to do something else and it's a wonderful moment as a supervisor because you know that that now the the training wheels are off and the student is cycling down the Tour de France route much faster than you can follow them it's another metaphor by the way <laughs> full of them today um, <laughs> yes in answer to your question yes there is a risk um, and all the all the things that you've heard from the rest of our panels a way that you can manage that risk. Um, okay, we have, I think we've got time for, we'll have, well, we've got two more questions showing. Have we got time for them? We'll have one more. So maybe just the gentleman there who hasn't asked a question. First off, I'd like to thank all of you for, exp I mean, sharing your experiential pearls of wisdom. And uh, my question is that, uh, I'm talking about stress. So I feel uh, the word stress is, I mean, connoted with a negative connotation, but I feel there is kind of a positive stress also, which makes you, I mean, drives you to do stuff. So your thoughts on converting stress into a positive stress? Okay. Um, <laughs> the question is about handling stress yeah. and whether some stress can be positive and how stressed you should be. So how stressed are we all? <laughs> I currently have uh, two weeks left of my PhD, so I'm, I'm, I'd say I was stressed a while ago. Now I'm fairly, I'd say I'm fairly comfortable with that. Uh, my stress period happened at the start of this year, where I, really, I sat down with my supervisor and went through all my work, and he said to me, you need to do a whole new chapter, at which point I panicked because I, ha I felt I didn't have enough time. Uh, so at that point, I had probably bad stress because I had no idea what to do and I was just panicking and I wasn't doing any work. The way to get over that is by planning. There is always enough time. I think there's a, a saying that goes around PhD students in my building especially is that you could probably do all your lab work for a PhD in six months if you knew what you were doing. The first year and a half, most of us kind of throw away our results because we don't know what we're doing in that time. So as long as you plan, you can get the work done. Um, and stress is helpful because it gives you a deadline and it means you don't get lazy and you remain focused which is, focus is probably one of the hardest things in a PhD because it is all self-motivated if you're not in your supervisor isn't going to pick up on it for a bit if you can blag your way through supervisions they might not pick, on, pick up on it for a while but it's not helpful because you eventually will become even more stressed so it's just about managing your time and being very, very self-motivated. And you can deal with stress. Stress is good sometimes, so it does help you. Anyone else like to go? Laura, you're going to yeah, comment on that? Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's, it's down to every individual, but I would say there's been a constant level of stress throughout my PhD so far, and I expect it to continue. I think you, it's, for me, it's because I know I want to do well, and I'm constantly questioning if I'm doing enough. But everyone will be different. I think there are, like they say, good and bad levels of stress. If you feel like it's becoming overwhelming during those bad days, bad weeks, I, again, would just suggest be vocal about it. I mean, don't chew people's ear off about it and, you know, keep going. But if you're worried, if you're stressed, it's normal. Talk to people. If you feel like it's overwhelming, definitely get help, get advice from people. But, yeah, I think the stress will drive you through your PhD, definitely. 
I think one of the most useful lessons a PhD teaches you is how to handle stress. It's a thing that will be most useful to you in the rest of your life because it ain't going to get any easier. I think the important thing is work out what the cause of the stress is. If it's that you have an awful lot to do, then planning is certainly the, the, the best way out of it. If it's that you feel the mountain is on top of you, then work out ways of having a little bit of free time, and I say it again, exercise and walking. Mm -hmm. If you feel it's because really you cannot cope with this, and this is really something you cannot succeed in, then talk this over with your supervisor very honestly, because you'll either discover that um, this is a mistake on your part and you're actually doing fine and you just need to accept that, or you may discover that actually it isn't and you may need to look for something else to do. I think, I mean, the first thing that Simon said when he spoke was about honesty and about honesty with yourself. Um, you've got to know how hard you're working and have an awareness of how you're getting on, and that's difficult to do. Um, PhD supervisors will try and manage your stress up to a point. With my PhD supervisor, when I used to go and see him, he used to make me feel so good that when I used to go and see him, I used to take a day off afterwards. Um, because he quite correctly observed that I was really, really stressed and overworking. And so he knew what he needed to do was calm me down um, and send me out of there in a spirit that I would relax. For another student, that would have been a disastrous strategy. Some students obviously need to be told hey, you know, it's really nice to see you looking so well, but you need, to, you need to do a bit more work here. So the supervisor will try and manage how you're doing. They may or may not get it right. So the most important thing is for you to manage yourself. And, and although it sounds like a very small piece of advice, I would echo very strongly Susan's comment about exercise because you have got to keep yourself well. Um, it, it, it has so many benefits for you, and if you can keep yourself physically well, the rest often follows. And when, you're, when your career is sitting around reading books all day, it isn't always easy. So get down the gym. That's my advice to you. Never mind these walks, Susan. Get down the gym. <laughs> so um, can I add something about the stress? Yeah, very quickly, and then we'll yeah, put it. So one of my supervisors said to me the other month that I was, not to toot my own horn, that I was the most relaxed PhD student he'd ever seen. And I was like, awesome. And it was, it was after a while that I realised that was a euphemism. Um, so it's kind of the flip side of, of, of what Gavin said. Um, just that, you know, well, so my supervisor's kind of, was, he was trying to tell me that I, I needed to maybe, you know, be a bit less complacent and work a bit harder. Um, so it's worth listening out to what your supervisor says and trying to read between the lines a little bit. He, he might not have been trying to tell you that. <laughs> he might have just been making a positive comment about your happy disposition. Maybe, yeah. Um, but um, on that note, I would like to thank all of our panellists for taking the time to come and share their experiences with us today. Um, it's been very nice listening to you all. Um, the next thing we have today is Helen Eastham, who's going to talk to us about ISAS. So I think probably the, the, the panel can maybe leave the stage and Helen can come up and we'll carry on. Thanks, Dave.